oh, that horrible things that happen. No, you're really missing the point. That's a great opportunity for. It's like, oh, time out. No, it's a horrible thing. You know, some <laughs> things are just flat out bad. Uh, welcome to the Art of Charm podcast and welcome to the show. I, I've been hearing your voice for such a long time. It's finally <laughs> great to meet you, Daniele Banale. Thank you so much for having me. I really nice. appreciate it. Obviously, we're going to dig into your podcast and storytelling this month being storytelling. Really, history is the ultimate storytelling. Right. That's exactly what it is. And we were laughing before the show. A lot of us, when we encounter history, it's in a boring classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And the narratives that get shared typically involve memorizing lots of dates, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more richness to history. And that's really why Johnny and I enjoy your show and digging more into the actual stories behind history. And, and what grew your fascination with history? I think to me is I grew up as an only kid before internet. So you have a lot of ways to get bored, right? <laughs> so to me, being in my brain, making up stories was what I started doing I don't know, when I was three, four, five, it's just like, you know, there's only so much time that your parents can spend playing with you. So to <laughs> me, it was like, okay, time to turn on imagination. And, and so history was awesome because it would give me material to work with. I would have uh, something gathered and what I see outside the window every day in a modern society where I lived. I had access to all these other ways in which people have lived, dressed, looked like, uh, fought, did all this other stuff. And I was like, this is awesome. It, it gives me so much more material to play with. So really was for me, history was about storytelling from day one. And that was Milan, Italy. Yeah. And I can, you know, for all of us, when we go to Europe, we're exposed to so much history. Sure. It's, it's quite overwhelming. And I was telling AJ today that your show and, and, and some others like yours had given me the opportunity to learn about stories in certain cities. Because when you're exposed to a museum or you go to a city, you're exposed to thousands of years of history, but you have no context and it's right. all hitting you in the face at one time. But if you can narrow down mm -hmm. and follow one narrative through, you can learn so much about that city. And then it's connections to other eras and other times. Totally. You know, the funny thing though, is that even though Italy is obviously there's everywhere you turn, there's something that's 2000 years old or something. I really didn't care about Italian history growing up there, yeah. probably because I was a snobby little shit. So I was like, <laughs> oh, because it's all around me everywhere. Pff, who cares? I'm interested about stuff happening across the globe, not this stuff. Now I dig it. You know, now I can appreciate it because when it is not, I don't take it for granted the same way. So now when I go back, I'm like, man, this is amazing. You know, but when I was growing up around it, I was like, yeah, don't care about this part. Give me the other stuff. Give me anything but European history. And was there a, a story or a period of history that really hooked your imagination at the start? You know, one thing that I, I, mean, I think there's something fascinating in pretty much any time period, but the, the things that I tend to gravitate the most toward tend to be tribal stories people living as small tribes, whether you're talking about, you know, prehistory kind of stuff, or whether you're talking about 150, 200 years ago, American Indians on the Great Plains, that kind of tribal life where your whole society is made up of like at most a few hundred, maybe a thousand, two thousand people. So it's all a face to face community. You know, everybody, everybody's part of, and you are there's no state above it. They're just you, your tribe, the land, other tribes you have to interact with. There's something about it, probably because that's the way as human beings we have lived for the longest period we've been around. They fascinate me. They kind of speak to me on a level that's like, this is who we are at the core. This is how, what made our DNA for 99% of the time we've been around, you know? So I find that really intriguing. Of course, that's the hardest one because there's usually very little, there's pretty much nothing written. So in terms of sources to reconstruct, it's not the easiest thing. One and of the things I enjoy about the show is when you run into those places, you give as much context and facts as you can, mm -hmm. and then you give a few different narratives to allow your audience to choose from, sure. from, from the sources that you've read, which is great because right. I, I think we all understand the, the media that we're living to, in today 
is we've caught it being so slanted and so many times that it's difficult to sure. trust. And I wish, I certainly would wish the media would play that role as well. Like, listen, here's what we know, and this is it's, this is up to you. But it's it's force fed, yeah. and when you're hearing such history presented that way, it's qu quite refreshing, almost as if you have a bit of a hand in how you're perceiving it and, and what it means to you as well. Yeah, because ultimately anything has a bias. I mean, there are two levels of bias. There's the dishonest bias, which is like, I want to kind of shove my point of view down your throat, so I'm gonna tweak all the evidence to make you believe what I believe. That's messed up, we get it, that's dishonest. But there's another level that's completely unavoidable. You know, whereas the first one is avoidable, the second mm -hmm. one isn't, which is just by virtue of who you are, like the storyteller or the journalist, the person framing the story, there are going to be topics they are more into than others. So you're going to shine the spotlight on those topics more than others. Even if you're trying to be as objective as humanly possible, you can't, you know, yeah. you can be as objective as you possibly can. That never, doesn't really mean you are truly objective. And so it's good to be honest about it. It's like, look, this is the stuff I'm into. This is what I find. This is why I come to this conclusion. You do what you want with it. You know, it's like you see the path, you can either follow that or you can take those elements and take it in another direction. And obviously in your research, when we're talking about tribes and communities where spoken history is mm -hmm. really what we're talking about here. There's not even, I would argue, you know, the historians that we have today who have, you know, been steeped in the research, but these are just stories that the yeah. community shares about events that are happening to them. How do you tease out the disinformation and the spin that's going on in these narratives? It's hard. It's really hard because, I mean, it's like even in something happened 100 yards from here, there was going to be 10 witnesses who are going to tell you 10 different stories. And they are all right there, and it's happening right here, right now, let alone when you add time for stories to change. The person who wasn't really there, but heard it from his cousin, second <laughs> remove, who told him that maybe... So, you know, the room for mistakes is huge. And I think that's understood with all history, that there's the legend and there's the history. The legends we know, we usually know a few of variation of it. The actual history we can tease out and make educated guesses about. It's about as good as it gets. And in your fact-finding missions to build out these narratives on the podcast, um, obviously there's a lot of time spent. Mm -hmm. And we understand that as Johnny was laughing about earlier, to the victors go the spoils, mm -hmm. right? And we've even seen now some of our historical figures that we grew up looking up to, stories have come out about sure. their checkered past and, and maybe the history that we were taught in schools isn't truly the way it of happened. Um, how do you tackle those issues when you encounter them and building out the narrative? Well, and that's what I always found weird because what you're referring to is often colored by nationalism. How in every country, everyone want to make their founding father or their whatever the hell, the good guys, right? The whole story is we are the good guys and by default that means the other guys are the bad guys. But you know, there's this, and to me, I don't get it. Cause it's like, why? You know, nobody's gonna accuse you today of being responsible for what somebody has done five generations ago. So you can be honest about it. You know, if it looks like the, that record is kind of shady, how about we call it for what it is, you know, and be up. So that, that mechanism of like, I have to defend somebody who had lived uh, generations ago against the evidence makes no sense to me. To me, it's like, I'm all for nuance. You know, I'm not saying, you know, you need to just point the finger from where you sit today saying what they should have done 200 years ago and they are all terrible people because but at the same time, you know, also call it for what it is. You know, there are certain lines that you don't cross. And when somebody does cross them, I don't care the time period or when, there are not too many ways to spin around, uh, you know, enslaving babies. That's bad in all times, <laughs> in all situations, you know, it's right. like, that just, that's it. So I always find that, and also that topic, the you shouldn't judge the past by today's standards is always funny because it tends to be brought up when somebody's judging the people you like, <laughs> not when people are judging the people you don't. Then it's totally fine when they are judging the people you don't like. Right. But the enemies are fine. Sure. The heroes, let's but not But suddenly question. it's like, no way, it was a different time. You should understand. And I did actually, there was a series that um, I did with Daryl Cooper from Martyr Made Podcast where we kind of covered these um, 
one story from the 1860s, which was this massacre of the Cheyenne at Sun Creek, and then Daryl Culver, My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. And it was funny, because I remember on my public page on Facebook, we were talking about historical massacres and things like that. And as long as we were talking about Nazis or communists, yeah. they were like, can you believe those terrible, horrible people? And then suddenly it's Mila is like, well, you under to understand they were under a lot of pressure <laughs> and it's easy to I'm like, where was this all this human understanding when it was the other guys? You know, it's like the same rule should apply. <clears throat> yeah. And unfortunately when we look back at all of our histories, there's going to be some light moments and there's going to oh, be yeah. some dark moments, mm -hmm. especially when war is involved. And I and I think this is what makes, you know, with the, all these new formats, with the technology we have to be able to tell these stories over 11 hours, do you really get an opportunity, at least for you and Daryl and, and, and Dan, to, to humanize some of these characters mm -hmm. to such a level that for the first time of hearing this, maybe this story you've heard in history class and, and all through your yeah. life, but the, the new context that you have where you are now looking at this and this character as he's just like me, but he was in this situation. And now you're, you're completely sucked in because dates are just that they're logistical. But when you put it in context of a story, now your emotions are engaged. Right. And the more you can humanize these characters, uh, the, the, the more uh, you're in, engaged and, and, and emotions are flying. And, you know, some, when I'm trying to turn people on to some of this stuff and they're like, how, how long is this? Oh, this, this podcast is only 11 hours. Don't worry about it. They're like, what? Right. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, however, uh, we were just talking about Daryl Cooper. It's like the minute th that is laid out, you're you're instantly hooked. You want to mm -hmm. go through the whole experience. Yep. No, and that's the same thing. Um, I remember when I first was introduced to Dan Carlin's work, I listened to, um, there was this series that he did on the fall of the Roman Republic. And so, of course, growing up in Italy, I've heard that story about 72 million times. <laughs> right? so, like, so I listen and I'm like, okay, it's cool. I dig it. I'm not yet 100% sold to the first episode, but I'm like, it's good enough. I'll, I'll check more, right? And then by the end of episode two, I'm there at the edge of my seat going like, what happens next? And then I catch myself because I'm like, I know exactly what happens <laughs> next. I know all the character. It's like, but that's as good as a storyteller as he is that suddenly he slowly, because it's not like this over the top from one second one is like, draw you in. It's a slow process of drawing you in. And once you're in, you're in for real. You know, he does a phenomenal job with it. And when did you realize that podcast was a medium that you wanted to participate in and start sharing these stories? Well, I had a really weird intro to podcasting because um, I think my first podcasting experience was in 2011 and it was in the deepest end of the pool you can possibly end up because I think he was the very first I ended up in was Joe Rogan podcast and I didn't know what podcasting was, right? And back then and still today, Rogan's podcast was humongous. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, today even more so than back then. It's, yeah. And so I, I remember walking in the studio and there was uh, Brian Redman and I'm like, Joe hasn't come in yet. And Brian was there and I'm like, podcasting? Kind of like, what are we doing here? And he was like, <laughs> it's like radio, but you can cast. And I was like, okay, good. I got it. <laughs> we're, we're good with that. And so it's like, Suddenly, after being on Joe's show, I realized just how many people were listening. And I'm like, damn, that's a whole medium that I was ignoring that I didn't know about. And now I'm realizing what a big impact it has on so many people. So then I started becoming kind of a guest on a bunch of podcasts. And then lots of people were like, hey, you should start your own thing. And so I'm like, I guess, sure, you know. And initially I started more uh, Joe's type of show, you know, more guests and chats and interviews. But then that's when I started putting two and two together and I'm like, okay, I teach history for a living. I am podcasting. My probably my favorite podcast is dance hardcore history. Doesn't take a genius. <laughs> Maybe I should do the same, you know, right. different from Dan, but with my own spin, but get into it. And there was plenty of room with each of one of his episodes taking 10 months. Right. To <laughs> like <laughs> suddenly me having these two episodes a year. Right. And so I was like, but even that was funny because from the moment I decided to start it to when I actually released the first episode, probably a year and a half went by because what I was thinking is I don't want to do, you know, I do all the research and then I released one or two episodes and then, okay, see you guys in eight months. You know, it's like, I want to have enough lined up that 
I can mm-hmm. then buy myself some time to do the research for episode nine or something, right? But I've, uh, I, I guess I still, despite knowing how history work, I kind of underestimated the amount of work that goes into it, which is insane. It's like every time I get through a series, I'm like, never again. This, <laughs> this is painful. I Because you, you need to become an instant expert on something. Mm-hmm. And you don't become an instant expert. So you need to go to at least like 10, uh, 400 page book and read the same story a zillion times before you start seeing it from all these different angles and then you really know your story and obviously you saw this as an extension of of teaching just to reach more people yeah um and we certainly know that you put a lot of work into building out these stories how much comparatively goes from from the work of the story itself but also character develop it so that the, the audience can connect yeah all in all i'd say an average hour and a half, two hour episode takes probably about somewhere between 100 and 200 hours of work behind it. So it's a lot because, you know, first you need to read all the books and you take all the notes on the books. Then you come up with sort of the the bare bones of the story. And as you read more books, you add elements to this bare bone outline of the whole thing. Once you have the whole outline, okay, now you have a lot of information, but it's tedious as hell. So you need to now spice it up. So you need to you know, connections, things that as you read come to mind, references to pop culture, joke that comes in, or characters, how you want to flesh them out, how you, why should anybody care, which is ultimately the key question on any storytelling, right? It's like when you're telling a story, I see it a lot in school when people teach. People walk in with the assumption that somehow people owe them attention. I'm like, nobody owe you, Jack. You know, it's like nobody, it's your job to hook people in. To hook people in who shouldn't, you shouldn't assume that they care even a tiny bit about the topic. Okay, it's your job to make the story interesting enough and ultimately human enough, you know, something that anybody who has a heartbeat can relate to, that they are gonna have some angle by which they are intrigued because you ultimately are talking about human emotions and things that, you know, the same way as if you put on a Hollywood production is designed to appeal to a ton of people through just basic human stuff that most humans can relate to. Same thing goes if you teach a class, the same thing goes into a podcast, same thing goes into anything, really. And talk about that hook for us when you're developing out, and maybe you can give us an example of a recent episode for you, how you come upon the hook and how you set up the story so that the audience is engaged. Sure. So, for example, earlier we were talking about kind of complex historical figures and relating to and connected to what you're asking about the hook. Like at one point I did this series on Theodore Roosevelt and I knew a few things about Roosevelt before and I have to go like, oh, he's a crazy bastard. It sounds like a cool <laughs> story, but, you know, not that deep. And so I started reading and reading and reading. And on some level, it was interesting because there's the aspect that turns you off. You know, when you read it today, he clearly grew up at a time that was insanely racist. So some of that definitely comes up, particularly in his earlier writings. He got better over time, which is something that helps in <laughs> liking. Right. Right? But he starts from a place that was that was everything he breathed around him was the culture was super racist. He never saw a war he didn't like, you know, he was a hardcore warmonger. So he's not my ideal guy in terms of foreign policy or (laughs) he had those issues that you look at it and you're like, that's a little problematic. But at the same time, there's so much to him as as a human being that you can, you know, there's a lot of his story that just you know, like when he's uh, when he's very young and he's um, severely asthmatic at a time when people hadn't figured out the you know the proper treatment for asthma. So their idea actually, when you were a kid and you had asthma, they would give you cigars to smoke because the idea was that it would strengthen your lungs. And you, so you know, it's a miracle that anybody survived. Pretty <laughs> much. But, you know, he was facing that kind of stuff, always being sort of this weak, nerdish guy in his books because he was always having struggling with a body that wasn't serving him well. And somehow through luck, through working out, through things he built for himself, a much stronger, healthier body, so much that he kind of builds a cult about this idea of uh, um, physical effort. That's one of his big things. When he's really young, like he's still in his early 20s, uh, he got married and his wife who just gave birth to a baby daughter dies 
the same day as his mom dies. So he comes home and he's like, that mother, that wife, here is a two day old kid to take care of. So, you know, there are these things that you could not care less about US foreign policy or politics or anything. You cannot, but you, stories like these are something that anybody can at least, if not relate through personal experience, at least imagine. You know what I mean? And be like, damn, if I was in that situation, how do, would I react to something that strikes such powerful emotional chords? And so that right there is your hook, right? That right there is like, okay, now I'm invested in this person. I want to see how they handle it, you know? So understanding the struggle that they've gone through, obviously we have these historical figures that we all revere and look up mm -hmm. to because of the stories that we've heard over and over again. But there's always that turmoil going on, no yep. matter who the hero is. And that. really hooking into that is how mm. you get that audience engaged. Yeah, one thing I notice is that most of the characters I'm interested in, and I tend to, I like all of the stories I cover, but I tend to dig extra the biographical ones where there's a clear lead that you follow through their journey. But most of them are mildly mentally deranged. <laughs> they all have serious <laughs> issues. I find them lovable for the most part, but they are not the most always well-adjusted human being ever, you know? So it's, uh, I mean, like, I think the first biography I did was Crazy Horse, and it's basically mm -hmm. the Native American version of The Punisher, right? It's, it's exactly The Punisher story, just with... Uh, and, you know, you just see, you picture what it must have been like to go through all those experiences, mountains of heartbreak and tragedy, and you're like, okay, I can see how the guy would have some issues. You know, you, you still like him because there's a very sympathetic side to him, but at the same time, you... Yeah, there's yeah. some real stuff going on there. There's you know? a lot of evil yeah. <laughs> woven into that story. Yeah, you know, it's it's something else that you you speak about and and bringing up the Punisher. You know, it amazes me how we continually hear how Hollywood has run out of ideas, and for the most part, you look at what they're putting out, and it's, right, it's easy to say that when through these podcasts we're hearing incredible story after incredible story. It's like, well, if they just did a little work or unless they've gotten conditioned to, well, it's not really about the story. It's what we need. To, we know what's going to be coming in. Yeah. I mean, Hollywood is funny because I've been in a lot, a lot, a lot of meetings about developing TV series oh, and uh, movies and things. And the number one you think you breathe in the room at all times is fear because <sighs> the thing is, you have to invest millions of dollars. This is not an investment that you can <laughs> afford to screw up. So there's always that, okay, this checks out, this checks out, this checks out, but w what could possibly go wrong that's not gonna get us our investment back? And you know, of course, when you approach it that way, nothing is gonna pass the no. test because unless no. like Marvel movies, it has been done already 5,200 times, nothing has been proven that for sure is gonna work no matter what. And inevitably, at some point, they have to take a chance. But you kind of see this process where they are like, no, 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 uh, okay, pick this one, you know, where it seems so random. Because sometimes you're like, really? You, you stress so much about this thing, which looks like a pretty good commercial success, and then you approve this? It's like, so a lot of the times, the mechanism behind it, I think they're, they are under so much pressure because the money involved is so insane and outside what we can normally think of that it's inevitably super conservative. And I don't mean politically conservative, mm -hmm. I mean conservative in terms of choices. Is you don't want to do something new because you could fail, and you don't want to do something that unless it's Marvel, everybody has done 10,000 times, because otherwise you're 10,001. And you want to be just in the middle, you know, where it has been done enough that we know it works, but we also know that the audience will still go watch it, you know? And that's kind of how the game works. And when you put your magnifying glass to these moments in history and you're building out that outline like you discussed, how do you pick that time frame and come up with the, the introduction to the story, the hook, what you're going to focus on, and then also sort of the payoff at the end? Because sure. it's really your job as the storyteller to pick, okay, day one, day zero, and okay, this is the end of my story. Yeah. <clears throat> and some of these struggles, I mean, they're still going on sure. to talk about tribal issues. Sure. Yeah, some of the things are, yeah, that's where 
to me in some way that becomes the most interesting part because yeah you're framing the narrative you know you have all the facts but you're giving it an arc and the arc is not obvious and the arc is something you have to figure out and so what is that would interest somebody right away in the first five ten minutes and how you want to close it like right now i'm working on this super long series that ends with something really dark where there's this I don't know why today is just it comes up this way it's like massacre number 3073 <laughs> it's like i swear it's not all like that but you know it like it ends with the wounded knee massacre and at one point i caught myself i'm like do i really want to send my listeners off after they have listened for hours and hours and hours where the last image they have is like some <laughs> baby dying in the snow after breastfeeding and choking on the blood of his dead mother is that really where i want to go with this it's like come on and it's like you don't want to put a ribbon around it and make it sound like oh but it's all a happy it's not it's a terrible story but okay how do i frame it because no i'm not gonna do that to people that's just <laughs> a bad way to end stuff and so then i shifted the focus to okay that does happen in 1890 and it's horrible and it's terrible but in that same story there's also a story of survival against overwhelming odds there's still a story of how Lakota culture that I've been looking at leading up to when the knee getting squashed in just about every way legally in terms of religious persecution in terms of the massacre it's like it looks still somewhat thriving today still finding a way and so you're not negating everything you have built up until that point but you give it a spin that doesn't going to you know it's not gonna have your listener going to shoot themselves after they are done it's like that was a great podcast right. now i'm just gonna go kill myself it's like <laughs> that's not the goal so obviously there's the hook that that moment that all of us as listeners humanizes whoever the main protagonist or character mm -hmm. in the uh, story is and then from there you got to zoom out and give context mm -hmm. right why does this matter and what's going on historically to put it in its place and then you have conflict yep. and a lot of we'll go into here in a bit involves a lot of dark conflict yep. and massacres but you are looking for something at the end to conclude in a way that the audience feels they've got some value out of yeah. it and they can take a positive <laughs> exactly spin yeah. on it yeah because ultimately yeah you don't want to be you know you want to be real and a lot of history is nasty and it feels like game of thrones right it feels heavy as hell nasty things happen but if that's your conclusion then it's like what's the point <laughs> just why right. even get up in the morning if that's how you're gonna feel about everything right so it's like you look at all the darkness but you also want to find whatever angle that also allow you to either deal with it or thrive despite all of it and i mean at some point i remember talking with dan carlin we were like why most of the stories we tell are just terrible why is it always warfare and bloodshed <laughs> and this and that and you know the point he was making is because those are some of the most extreme stories in human experience mm -hmm. and you know the more powerful the emotions that you put on the table are the more invested you get into how the characters navigate those situations and i get that but there was a moment there where i was like okay but i also <laughs> want to do something different and so at one point one of the podcasts that i was uh, one of the series i was super happy with I did these two episodes on the life of this one Zen monk from the 1400s, E.Q. Sojun, who's my all-time idol, because his main priorities were Zen, sure, that's great, but mainly also drinking and women. And his whole life, while there's plenty of obstacle and conflict and thing, the guy manages to be happy in spite of the context he's in. And, you know, the context, like most historical context, is going to be a tough one, you know? But you don't feel it in his attitude. You don't feel it in his writing. You don't feel it in the way he relates to things. And so I found it refreshing. The guy who is like most of his stuff is about sex, happiness in the moment, and just the sense of a guy who has a tremendous zest for life. And I was like, ah, oh, man, that's refreshing once in a while to put the accent on that, not only on some terrible conflict taking place, uh, APIC doesn't have to always mean bloodshed and gore. APIC can also be a happy story. You could say it's a character study. Yeah. A, a very, of a very complex character. And, and of course, it's going to relate to a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned of uh, being extremes of the human experience, I can 
I can personally relate to some of, of how I now look at working out or how I go about my day directly as a response to some of the stories that I heard of, uh -huh. of this, of, of, ex, um, of human extreme of human experience. It's like, well, if that person could live through that, well, right. why am I freaking out <laughs> yeah. right now? And in fact, I need to get it together. Right. And, you know, it's, and, and just, and, and to be exposed to that and, and, and care through, through the storytelling. Do you think that is a bit of the professor coming through where it's like, well, let's make sure everyone learns something at the end of this so it's just not a slasher flick? Yeah, because ultimately it's like, why are we doing it otherwise? To me, anything, storytelling included, needs to be about elevating the quality of life. If it doesn't do that, then we're wasting our time, you know? And maybe we're wasting our time in a fun way, you know, in a haha -ha entertaining way. Sure, not everything needs to be about elevation of quality of life, but kind of, you know? To me, it's like, that's the point, is we all want to live happier, more fulfilling lives. So storytelling to me is awesome because of what you're saying. It provides archetypes. It provides kind of role models that they don't have to be perfect, even because if they are perfect, you can relate. No. It's like, that's great for you, but has nothing to do with <laughs> where I'm at today. They need to be somebody that you can relate to who managed to do something amazing in spite of all the demons pulling you down, you know? And so that to me, yeah, I have the same exact thing that you're describing, that moment where you're like, oh man, life is hard, this, that, and the other, and there's a story there that reminds you, yes, but there's a way out. Yes, but there's a way to rise above it. And, and you know, I love hero stories. That's, to me, is like, that's what you need in any story is powerful characters that make you feel good about being alive ultimately. Yeah, I think everyone's story is a story of survival. No. And some of these stories that you choose are the ultimate situations of life and death for mm -hmm. these people. And of course, the hero is gonna struggle with decisions, is gonna struggle with negative outcomes, and then hopefully rise above it so there is a life lesson that can be passed on when you're telling these stories that are involving you know mass violence massacres mm -hmm. death a lot of darkness how do you draw the line from when enough is enough for the audience of like how deep do i want to go into the darkness right. and how do you find your way out of that so that the audience again can move on from just all the death and destruction yeah i'm you know one of the things that I, i'm gonna tie back to what you're asking regarding storytelling but like one of the things that for example i don't like about the more positive thinking approach to things is that they tend to oversimplify answers is like oh that horrible things that happen no you're really missing the point that's a great opportunity for it's like oh time out no it's a horrible thing you know <laughs> some things are just flat out bad there's no spinning them into no but really it's good no it's bad <laughs> and uh, let's be real about it okay let's deal with what it is once we have looked at it long enough and we acknowledge that it's crap, then let's figure out, okay, it is crap, but what do you want to do about it? You know, how do you want to... Because sitting around and calling it for what it is is not going to help anybody. So how do you take terrible cards that you have in your hands and be able to play them in a way that's empowering? I'm a big fan of that process. You know, acknowledge the darkness, look at it, see it in all its ugliness and then try to move forward. I tend to find that in many cases, the more sort of motivational self-help tend to skip that step. They are, yeah, yeah, it was kind of dark, but you know, it's really, I mean, amazing. St it's like, no, 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 too soon. You know, it's like, because it, to me, it feels fake. You know, to me, it feels like you're not being real. You're not being honest about what that feels like. And ultimately, you're also making it sound too easy. Like for somebody who's quoting it, it doesn't feel good to be told, no, no, really, it's a great, it's like, come on, man. Have first empathize with what it means to be in that situation. Then you can move forward. But if you don't go through the process, you're never going to move forward in a way that's real. Uh, it's, you may in a way that's like fake self-talk, but not in a way that goes deep. So in answer to your question, I think it's very important to just be, to dive deep, to look at the darkness for all its ugliness and then help people kind of come out from the other end. So they are not, it's like darkness, darkness, darkness. Okay, guys, see you next time. It's like, no, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, you right. don't want to do that. But, but to show a path out. 
Well, it's certainly a, a, um, a large theme in philosophy of losing yourself or reaching the darkness in order to find your way back and truly know who you are. <laughs> because who, how can you know who you are if you haven't put yourself in that position or have, have, have been there? And there's yep. many different ways of going about that. But and until and, and you come back through, and I think Joe just posted something about that as well. Um, and we see it. And, and certainly in philosophy, uh, every uh, f um, tradition has that story, um, and we and we and you guys have certainly shown it in in your stories mm -hmm. that you you tell. Yeah, it's it's important because that's that's life, right? Life is conflict, life is loss, life is failure, but it's not all that life is, or it doesn't have to be. And so it's like showing that path through the hard stuff, through the failure, through all of it. And again, not rushing it, because when you rush it to mean you're missing the real ability to come out strong from the other side. You know, you don't just go, I'm weak, I'm gonna lift weights for two days and now I'm strong. No, take your time, <laughs> you know, you need to process that. You need to really feel it so that when you come out, it's real. There's a real strength behind it. It's not something that can be um, the next time the reality really shows its ugly face, you realize that mm, you weren't quite as oh everything is for the best kind of thing, and and so that's kind of how I approach it in all in all the stories. I have zero problem with dealing with the really hard stuff, but I also want to show an arc uh, because otherwise, again, I can tell depressing stories all day long. But why? <laughs> you know, why are we doing it to ourselves? That's right. not the point. And we talked about this in our toolbox episode about essentially there are the details and the facts and the logical part but really when we're telling a story we're painting with the emotions mm -hmm. and getting people to resonate with the emotions because that's what's universal right I yep. may not have been a warrior I may not have grown sure. up in the 1800s but the emotions and the conflict that those characters are feeling well yeah I can relate to that yep are there tools or techniques that you developed over time to paint those emotions more vividly how do you go about sharing that side of the story I think not everybody's wired the same way. So some people have a easier threshold to cross into. Like I remember as a kid, if I would watch a movie, it felt like I lived it. It felt like I was the character, right? And so then I would see other people watch the same movie with me and two minutes later are cracking jokes. I'm like, no, how are you not <laughs> still in that space? You know, it's like, that was a powerful, takes a while to digest it all. and. And so that's when I realized, okay, maybe I have a different mindset where my immersion into the story goes to a kind of another level, which is not good or bad. It's just more intense for whatever good or bad as it may be. And so to me, it's like, okay, how can I distill some of that for somebody who may not do the exact same process I go through? How can I create the hook faster? You know, and that's essentially, and so it goes back to the same emotions if you happen to feel them more intensely, well, it's even easier to then be able to communicate them to somebody because you, you know, they feel the same thing. They may have just not dwelled on it as much. Right. So in your preparation, you're you're emoting and sitting in there yeah. empathetically with the character to build out that structure. Oh, yeah. Before sharing it. Definitely. And of course, one of the things that we enjoy about your podcast as well is you do add humor and right. there is moments where you would think in these dark stories humor might not work right how do you go about adding humor to these stories yeah i don't know i mean i kind of part of the way i grew up was like you find something funny in the weirdest situation right it's just part of the gig so and in some ways like the uglier it gets the more that there's that powerful weapon that is gallows humor that come in that is like I mean, otherwise, again, you should, the alternative is you shoot yourself because it's so nasty <laughs> and ugly, or you find a way to laugh about it and keep going despite it all. And so to me, finding something funny in like situations that are clearly not funny and they are ugly and heavy is super important. And I deeply admire people who are able to do that. And again, it can be forced. It can't be, hey, I know that being finding humor in tragedy is great. So let you know, because you feel it when it's right. forced. You need to come from who you are, really, and just your attitude of like, yeah, here we are. So <laughs> let's let's find a way to go through this. With uh, with the deal with some of your sponsors and Luminary, 
you, I remember when you had guaranteed a certain amount of shows and certainly knowing that the workload that you have with everything else that you're doing and yeah. teaching and martial arts and the other podcasts and, and what it takes to put together the research for one of these stories. I, I'm sure at times you feel run down or just beat up or uh, just uninspired because you've put so much out there. How do you deal with those with those times? I mean, there's yes, sure. And there's definitely the clock ticking and you're <laughs> like, OK, this is great, but you need to get another story next month. So hurry up a little. But at the same time, I think there's a level where, you know, if I, I probably have some documents where I listed just kind of brainstorming some of the stories I like to cover. And, you know, there's enough material for the next 72 years, right? So <laughs> I'm just like, uh, you know, there's an element that while, yeah, it's a lot and man, I'm tired and this and that, there's also a sense that like, oh, I can't wait to get to tell this story. So it kind of motivates you to, eh, let's pick up the book and start reading and go through it because it's a good story and I can't wait to dive into it. Of course, halfway through, you're like, <laughs> ah, Jesus, this again, <laughs> you know, but it's, um, but no, it, I enjoy it. You know, ultimately, I enjoy telling these stories. I find, I enjoy studying them. I enjoy telling them. So it, uh, while the workload is definitely intense, it's a topic that I'm super passionate about, so it helps. And we all, oh, I was just gonna say, so obviously with all the prep that goes on and, and you delving deeply into the story, is there something you look for when you now feel ready to hit record and, and share it with an audience? How do you work through that? And I know a lot of our audience thinks about stories and it's like, well, that's not ready, or I don't have this sure. component, or I don't have the humor. How do you know when it's ready to share. To me, there has to be, like the number one requirement is epic. You know, if I have even one moment in a story where I'm like, man, that's such a powerful moment. That's such a great line. That's, uh, then I'm like, okay, okay, we can work with this. <laughs> we can work, because if, uh, I'm sure if I find that one, there are gonna be other moments in the story that are powerful. And so if I get that moment where I'm like, I can't wait to, like my daughter always, she's 10 years old now, she's always asking me to tell her stories, right? And so it's like, if I get to tell a five minute story to my daughter, that's short enough to keep attention span going, but powerful enough to get her super interest, then I have something that I can develop in something larger, right? So it's, uh, there are these little snippets that, you know, you test them out. Can you keep the attention of a child and keep them at the edge of their seat? Okay, you can, boom, you got a story. Then you can develop it and add to it, you know? And obviously, how has this parlayed into your sharing your own stories and your own history of being a student in history and now having this podcast where you share these historical stories? How has that translated into your personal storytelling? I mean, to me, it's like, that's why, in fact, when you guys told me, oh, we're going to chat about storytelling, I'm like, perfect, because that to me, everything is storytelling, right? That's like in everything I do, whether I'm teaching, whether I'm writing, whether I'm doing the podcast, whether I'm hanging out with my daughter, storytelling is in everything. And it's what makes, uh, give meaning to life in a lot of way, gives you strength in moments when you don't have it. So. Uh, like all we got into some degree are stories and they are what makes the difference between perceiving external reality in a, in a situation and perceiving external reality in a, you're excited and can't wait to tackle it. So I just, and I, you know, I play the same process with myself. You know, there are all the times in life when you're dealing with heavy stuff, when you're struggling, when you feel run down and, and having in the back of your mind some stories that you focus on to give you that energy for that extra step, give you that energy for, okay, but I'm not totally crushed by this yet. It goes a long way because uh, it's very much kind of Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know, yeah, it's, we talked it's about it that is. in the toolbox and we all can resonate with those stories when we see them elsewhere. It's now seeing our own life Sure. that same pattern and being able to share it. And that's where, uh, you know, like right now, I would love to be able to write another book, but again, because of the podcast, it's really hard to find time for anything. But like the last book I did was something that was weird because I, it was, it was sort of autobiographical in a lot of ways. Actually, 
pretty much always, which always felt weird to me because I'm like, that's some vain crap. It's like, what are you gonna? Oh, let me tell you about how my life is so. It's like, screw you, you know. That <laughs> it felt really wrong in a lot of ways, but at the same time, I realized that there were some parts of that story. And I mean, it's not a I was born in, and you know, it's not that kind of. It, it's a thematic autobiographical right. thing, but like on certain themes, I'm like. I can talk about these in a philosophical, more principle-driven kind of way, and sure, it can be interesting, but when you make it personal, when you make it, okay, this is me in that situation, not as this is how you should act uh, in an abstract way and it's always way too easy and way too clean. It's like, no, that's the reality. This is what I know. This is how I feel. This is how I tackle. That I realize anytime I tell stories in that way, people respond 10 times more. And not just respond like, oh, I want a bigger audience, respond in a, it helps them more because they can relate more. And so I was like, okay, that's a different way to go about storytelling because suddenly I'm the main character in a tale. I'm like, oh, okay, that's different. And of course you can't really, you know, you tell it, but you, it's harder. Whereas when you're talking about somebody else, it's very easy to see how somebody will perceive that story. When you're talking about yourself, you don't because you know yourself too well you're like well you think that was awesome okay i'm glad you feel right. that way but i was like i was kind of winging it and i'm glad it worked out but so it's that in itself is a is a bit of a, but in some way i think there's a process where almost everything you touch has a little bit of autobiographical element because whatever story you tell is ultimately told through your process framed by your experiences mm -hmm. the lenses you have developed to look at reality through your whole life story so if you're talking about some italian painter from the 1500s or some lakota leader or some ultimately still filter through you and your experiences so a little bit of that is going to color any story you tell i think that's so wonderful when you get to hear a story that meant so much to you as a child mm -hmm. hear it as an adult with a completely different lens and that story still carrying the same power but means something completely different to you big time big time and and that's the evolution right it's like when you you're looking at something from this angle and suddenly you realize that there are many many other angles to tackle the same topic from and of course these stories that we share they become memories for others mm -hmm. and, and that is our own history being shared and passed on so the more compelling and engaging the story the more the other person can relate to the story, well, that is a story that will be shared more and, yep. and ultimately make you stand out and become more memorable. That's that's the game, right? That's how you're playing the whole, yep. Now, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but we know that because of exactly that, we're, we're perceiving the world in a certain light. And no matter if we're sharing a story about ourselves or we're sharing a story about a historical figure, our perception and perspective is going to be woven into that story. How do you tell or what is your barometer to judge if a story has been spun too much and maybe fake history mm. and and they've colored the lens of this sure. to be something that's just unrealistic and how do you get to what you believe is the truth in these stories i mean so of course is you need to have enough reliable sources and that's not always easy because there are a bunch of stories for which there are no reliable sources and then you're like okay this is the legend this is based on what we know about the context what we can assume make educated guesses but ultimately it's legend then there are the ones that are you know part legend part there's something that all the sources agree on okay we're good there but then there's plenty of room for things that's reported in the, by this one guy 50 years later, maybe not, you know, and you tell it that way, you know, you say, hey, this is how the narrative goes flowing. But part of that flow may not be real. You know, we know this and we know this. And then somebody argued that this is what happened in between. Maybe it did happen. Uh, this is what we have as evidence that it may have happened, but you know make your own mind about it and so you can either enjoy it as purely storytelling or you can assume that it's actual history and you know it's anybody's uh, work to figure it out now i know we've talked a lot about the history podcast you have another podcast mm -hmm. that johnny finds really enjoyable and we had just some simple questions here to end sure uh, around exactly that because it, it really aligns with a lot of the concepts that we talk about here on the show about value and and being giving to others 
Well, well, one more question before we get there. Sure. That I was kind of curious about. Obviously, you brought bring, the being a professor angle to the podcast and telling these stories. Now, after podcasting for so long, how has that changed the way you present information in the classroom? Yeah, I don't think it has because I never saw myself as I always saw my teaching in academia as I'm a ninja who somehow got in and says, don't tell anybody because I'm not really like that kind of thing. To me, it's like I approach teaching as storytelling with depth, with, you know, you do the historical process, you want to be accurate, all the good stuff, but ultimately I approach it in that fashion. And so I was never like the professor who gets into storytelling is I do storytelling and I happen to do it in a classroom some of the time. So in that regard, there's really no change because it's the same way as I mean, in the classroom, you don't have the same time to go in depth in certain topic, but you do the same thing quicker. You know, you kind of you have to graze the surface a little more mm -hmm. and you can spend five hours on the story of one person. But, you know, you're doing the same things just on a bit of a higher up the surface, but the, the dynamics don't change. So my teaching has been kind of the same ever. And I would assume the goal for your students is to go just deep enough where they'll do the other four hours that you didn't have the time <laughs> right. for. Right. And, you know, you <laughs> throw it them. out there and if you dig it, there's a lot more. And if you don't, goodbye. You know, that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of the idea is I'll try to make it fun. I'll try to entertain you. I'll try to make sure that you learn something. And then if you want to go deeper, great. I want, so one of my other joys of th that all this technology has brought, certainly uh, history has been one of them. And the, my other is philosophy mm -hmm. and knowing that you are very, um, not only in the Western tradition, but also the Eastern tradition sure. in the, the, the other podcast being uh, drunken Taoism, yep. right? Uh, I always sometimes that word throws me off. How um, AOC, the art of charm? We one of the things that we we have a philosophical core, and that philosophical core is what is the value that you're bringing to your interactions and to the world around you, which uh, pretty much flows really nicely with Taoism. Um, and so when it comes to storytelling, and it comes to living in that tradition of bringing value to others around you in a day uh anything that you could speak of and th through that that point yeah i think one of the things that interested me about uh, taoism is that unlike most any philosophy or religion that you need to believe certain things to be that thing you can be a hundred percent taoist in worldview without ever having read a damn thing about Taoism or know even what Taoism is. Mm -hmm. Because to me, what interests me about Taoism is that it very much speaks the language of life. It's kind of like somebody who sits at the window and describes the way the universe works. It's not even to argue it. It's not uh, something you need to believe or disbelieve. It's like, look out the window, and that's exactly how reality works, right? So I find it refreshing because it's... Um, even though it doesn't feel like that, because you know you read the Tao Te Ching, and depending on the translation, it can get really complex, and it's not for everybody to get into. Once you break down the basic principles, they are everywhere in anything. You know, it's sort of that uh, if you become a master at anything, you are gonna be applying those principles in your life, and whether you know it or not, they are the exact same thing. So you can derive the same insight from completely different fields. To, uh, to and, and really they help you navigate life easier. And what are those principles that you live by? Uh, for example, there's um, like the first line of the Tao Te Ching is funny because sometimes it's translated as uh, the Tao that can be explained is not the real thing. It's not the eternal Tao. And it's like, well, that should also be the last line of the book, right? Because that if you can't do it, then why are we wasting time? And he's telling you, look, words are great because that's how we communicate as human beings, but they are a limited tool. They are verbal symbols. They are trying to get, describe reality with. They are not the same thing as reality. And so much miscommunication takes place all the time between people. So many arguments are based on symbolic semantics rather than reality. So he's always telling you kind of like, okay, we're gonna be using this, but remember, language and the real thing are two different things. So that's something that's always helpful. But to, on a much deeper level, when you ask about principles, like even something like the yin yang symbol, you know, it's telling you like whoever designed it way back thousands of years ago was a damn genius because it's so perfect in its simplicity, right? 
so much of the view of duality that exists in the world is like there's a clear cut line between one side and the other and one is good and the other is evil and they are fighting each other across this rigid line and it's based on conflict Taoism is telling you everything is made of opposite energies male female cold and hot uh, sun and dark you know everything is made and there's always a balance between those two things if you are able to find the right balance in the right situation boom everything is going to be easier if you don't find the right balance in the right situation your life is going to be harder simple as that in a way it's like a philosophical kind of surfing everybody gets it that you need to be in balance on the board on top of a wave the skill is in reading the ocean reading everything around you so that because balance doesn't mean you're always in the middle either that's not balance that's being dogmatic in a different way not in a completely black or completely white but is i'm gonna be dogmatic in the middle it's like that's it would be nice if life was that simple it's not you know one of the key things of Taoism is everything is constantly changing so your skill your ability is to learn the right balance in each situation that's constantly changing as well and in some cases balance may not look like balance in some cases you are tilted 95 percent <laughs> one way but it's exactly what's needed at the moment two seconds later the balance has shifted and so you need to tilt it back real fast and in that sense is uh, that's why i find surfing a powerful metaphor for what Taoism is about because it's essentially teaching you how to navigate life and of course it's not a it's not a hey here are seven easy steps to become a perfect uh, life surfer it's like learning how to cook it's like learning anything that's a, that's an art to some degrees you have principles you learn those but ultimately some people are gonna have a genius for it it's like your grandma who's an amazing chef and goes no not ready not ready now and they make the call in the right moment and, and that tastes 10 times better than a minute later or a minute earlier that to me is something that fascinates me about Taoism because it's built on uh, being completely not dogmatic in nature it's telling you that's how life works but a lot of it experimentation and a lot of is uh, contextual yeah that acceptance Mm -hmm. for what is happening mm -hmm. and that flexibility to adjust to what's happening flexibility is key i mean think about uh, and again you to give an example of how you can apply to everything let's say you have kids right you think i need to give structure to my kids they need to have discipline they need to do this for some kids that's perfect that's exactly what mm -hmm. they need but you apply that model which is good with kid a to kid b and they are pissed off and they hate you and your ability is to be able to read the situation and go, that's not what this guy needs. With him, we're gonna do something a little different. There still will be some of the discipline, but a lot will tone that down a lot because what they need instead is more kind of giving them responsibility, letting them make choices, be a little more free. And it's not that one model is good or bad, is one model is perfect for one kid, one model is perfect for another if you apply a good model in the wrong situation you still screw things up um, and, and i think obviously with the study of history mm -hmm. this idea of humility and being humble mm -hmm. you know even when we think about our heroes and the legends and the stories that you've investigated they're all flawed of everyone course. is flawed even the people we look up to and elevate are flawed so we need to look at our own flaws in the same way mm -hmm. and be humble and have some humility on one end and at the same time being kind of being kind to yourself it's like it's great to have high expectations but hey man we understand everybody screws up you know ease up on yourself a little and even that speaking of Taoism is a temperature right some people are way too quick in making excuses for themselves well then let's cut down on the excuses and get your act together a little more some people are way too hard on themselves and so it's like I appreciate this drive for self-perfection, but tone it down three notches because you're driving yourself crazy. And so even that is this kind of balancing act that you right. do. It's not one or the other. It's nope. not either or. Yep. You know, I, as we get older, we, we, we slowly start to put that balancing act for ourselves. And, and still at times it can be difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but some of the characters that you've covered 
their balancing act certainly looks a lot different than probably any of ours. Is a Diog- Diogenes being one of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, right. and there was a few other characters that you had put together. And and I love the comparison that you made of him of the, to Gigi Allen, which right. I, I died. Um, I would been, I've been waiting for somebody to put... I had thought was I was the only one that had made that connection. Right. But when you... When you look at those people, and, and I, I like Bukowski seems to be one of those characters mm-hmm. as well who cannot live con- very conventionally, but yet you're getting something and an intelligence and an and a, and a angle that you, that only they can bring to a situation to to, to give you a, a, a you know a, a better view of it that that no one who lives a straight life or a well balanced act can and can put together. Yeah, sometimes there's power in being off balance. <laughs> <laughs> there's something to be got that you can get from that as well. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank obviously, you. we've we've mentioned your podcast a yes. bit here, but where can our audience find you and all this phenomenal work? So all the, um, I think the first 47 episodes of History on Fire are all uh, freely available on iTunes and all most of the other things. Most of the new ones are just exclusive to Luminary, but if you haven't checked the podcast before, you have a long way to catch up to. So <laughs> there are uh, many, but all the new ones are on uh, Luminary Premium, so that's the way to go. And uh, other than that, I'm sure you know everybody knows how to use Google. It's easy <laughs> enough once you spell the name correctly to find all the relevant links. Well, thank you for joining us. It was a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. But I feel I